Hello and welcome to the Casual Author Podcast for today's episode. Today is Tuesday, August 1st, 2023 as I record this. And this is episode number 86 of the podcast. Today we're talking to Stephanie James about her book, The Spark Igniting Your Best Life. So we talk a lot about positivity. We talk about reigniting that spark. You may have lost the spark of motivation, of happiness, of joy. And we talk about bringing that back and how that incorporates into your life, particularly with your authoring career, whether or not you are casual. We talk a little bit about, you know, being busy. We both have a lot of things going on in our lives. So it's a really frank discussion about the reality of having everything work together, you know, not being able to drop certain things to quote unquote, um, you know, do the things you just want to do. I mean, there's the reality of being an adult, being a parent, having a job, all of these things, they don't have to get in the way of you living your best life. So you want to stick around for that conversation. I think you'll really enjoy it. So if you're listening today, you may have noticed that I did not post an episode last week. Um, we had a lot going on last week that kind of prevented me from um, getting the episode up as I hoped it would. Um, there's just a lot going on on the homestead as well as with all of our kids and their extracurricular activities as well as at work. So that being said, um, I am going to have to shift this podcast schedule just a little bit. I'm going to continue working on it because it does bring a lot of value to my life and I'm hoping and providing a lot of value to you. However, that does mean I'm going to be reducing it to every two weeks rather than every week. This is not a change that I think will be permanent. We are running through the summer and fall months on the homestead. There's just a lot more to do. There's a lot more overhead work with the animals to take care of. Um, and then there's all the prep for winter that I have to do out in the yard. Great things. They're great things. It means more audiobook time, which I'll never complain about. But it does mean that I have less time to get on and interview people and make these podcast episodes. So uh, something just to keep in mind, I will still be publishing the episode, but it will be every two weeks for the foreseeable future. More than likely when the winter months come up, I'll be able to pick the schedule back up to once a week uh, because there's just a lot less to do outside. I also do need to practice being more efficient <laughs> with the production of the episodes because I am doing it all on my own. I don't have a team or anybody helping me. So I just want to make sure that I am able to continue providing the value for you. I would rather continue doing it every two weeks rather than stop. So that's heads up for you. It will post most likely. So every other week, um, it's, it's not going to align with like the, I think I'll probably align it with the first and second, or excuse me, the first and third Wednesdays per month. Although it might get a little off schedule because I'm hoping to do about every two weeks. So keep that in mind. If you have questions, let me know. But that is the way it will be. So that being said, a lot has happened in two weeks on the homestead. To spare you the boring details, I won't go into everything that has happened. But <laughs> one of the biggest things was the processing of the chickens. I'm not going to go into any grisly details because more than likely you are some people listening who don't want to know those details. However, they're gone. <laughs> they're now in the freezer. We've processed them or we've canned a bunch of it as well. So my wife will go, we'll cut off the breasts and then we'll, you know, chunk them up and can them so that they're shelf stable. That is instrumental because there's something, you know, while freezer is great, it's not always like emergency ready because, you know, if the power were to go out, the, that freezer food is in danger. So we tried to can as much of it as we could to make it safer in the case of an emergency. Shelf stable things last longer um, as well. So in the freezer, you just kind of have to use it up so it doesn't get freezer burned. But on the shelf, it'll, it'll last a little bit longer. So um, it was a lot faster than we expected. So my father-in-law actually came into town. He surprised us, was like, hey, I'm going to come up, which was amazing because rather we were expecting to take all day with the, the actual butchering part as well as the processing piece the day after. But we did it so much faster because three people can work a lot faster than just two. Uh, I think we were able to do them in about two hours. And then when we actually pieced everything out and canned it and froze it, it took another probably three to four hours. So much faster. We were expecting to do it all day. So that meant I had more time to do other things, such as clean up the fence, you know, put their, their house away because we don't need it anymore. I was able to work on some of the goat thing, clean up their pen and sort out some of their um, other weed situations. There's a lot of thistle in their um, pen right now. And they don't need that, unfortunately. 
Um, surprise, believe it or not, goats are actually kind of picky <laughs> about what they eat. They don't eat everything. They eat kind of the wrong things. They eat the things you don't want them to eat. We don't have to go into details on that. Um, we've also been harvesting a lot of the garden. There have been more and more meals where everything or like 75% of the meal that we have is homegrown, which is a really good feeling. You know, you go to eat the food and you look at everything and say, oh, we grew most of this in our garden. It's a really great feeling. So that plus just clean up, general yard cleanup. We've got some family coming into town this week. So our yard isn't trashy or anything, but the wind blows and sticks fall off trees and you just kind of gather them up. So you got to gather them and burn them or put them in a composting space. So there's just a lot of that work done in the last couple of weeks, which, you know, the reality of a homestead. Um, In terms of authoring, (laughs) that has also ramped up. I am working on altogether too many projects at one time, which, you know, why not as authors? We do that to ourselves. What I'm finding is the things that I actually put value in or find value in are coming to the top, which is good. You know, this is kind of an exercise in life when you have a lot of things going on. The things that actually truly provide value for you tend to slide up to the top, or at least they should. Maybe they don't. But in this case, what I'm finding is social media is worming its way downward, which, you know, I have mixed feelings about because it can be fun in some ways. I don't love social media. But just the reality of it is it is kind of a time suck for me. And I was previously trying to, you know, kind of juggle a lot of different social media applications at the same time. And I'm finding that, you know, it's not that I don't find value in them. It's just that they're not providing a lot of value to my quality of life. And so that what you may have seen is I've kind of leaned out of social media. I haven't posted a lot on those things because I'm kind of leaning into the podcast and leaning into my email list and just leaning into the production value of my works. So I'm working on um, Dragon Blooded. I'm still in the editing phase. It's with the beta readers, which thank you, beta readers, for all the great feedback you've been providing to me. Uh, I'm also going through self edits. I'm scrutinizing the manuscript with pro writing aid, which is great. It just takes some time. <laughs> it's a very tedious process to run all of the reports on each chapter and go through each thing and consider each change. Um, so that's good. I'm hoping to deliver that to the editor in the next week, which would be great. And that's just for line edits. And I'm trying to sort out the cover situation with it, which is great as well. It's going to be a six book series. So I'm looking at a pretty high forward cost because I'd like to produce all six covers at the same time. So something to consider as well. Um, then I'm also working on the Cyber City book. So the Kids of Cyber City, so the, excuse me, Cyber City, if I can speak. The first two books are written completely. The third book, we are about halfway through. And the third book is proving very quick pace compared to the other. Not the other two are slow, but this is there's just a lot going on trying to wrap everything up. But the editing or the writing of it is, is really fun. Um, I kind of ended up taking two point of views on it. So they've got three point of views throughout the series. Uh, my co-author took one. Just naturally, I took the other two. Um, we didn't really decide that. Just We're both pantsers or discovery writers, and it just kind of fell into that. So that being said, the first two books, it was mainly two POVs per book. This book has all three POVs, so therefore I have a little bit more writing to do. I have no complaints. I love the writing aspect of it. Uh, I just feel bad because my co-author has had to wait for me a little bit. <laughs> Because it's easier when she's like, oh, I wrote my one chapter. It's your turn. You know, then I can shift my my focus back to Dragon Blooded or something. But in this case, it's like, oh, I wrote a chapter and I need to write another chapter. And sometimes I need to write another chapter, right? Because if I'm passing from those two POVs that I'm that I'm writing, I end up writing two or three chapters in a row, which is fine. I just feel bad that she has to wait <laughs> so long for me. That being said, it's a great book. I'm really looking forward to getting you those out for you. We'll have more information on betas for the whole series soon. I sent the first book to a couple beta readers and, you know, I've had some great feedback from them. But once we have the whole series in beta, I think it'll be great that, you know, we can package them up and send them to one person who might want to read the whole story. Additionally, I have <laughs> resurfaced The Etcher's Plight. So that is a an epic fantasy uh, manuscript. It's a starter of, I believe, a four book series. It's hard to say as a discovery writer. I've surfaced that for a writing group that I have become involved in. Um, it's great to meet other authors. Um, if you have the opportunity to get into a writing group, it's definitely worth it. Uh, but, you know, I've, I've already in the movement phases of Dragon Blooded. This Etcher's Plight book is still kind of in limbo phase. I haven't quite decided when or how I want to go about writing it. So I've surfaced it and I'm sharing those chapters with them, which is interesting. It's still a messy first draft. I'm not sure what they're going to think about it. But, you know, feedback doesn't scare me. It's no big deal. They may read and be like, none of this makes any sense whatsoever, which if that's the case, then that's fine. I mean, it's just a first draft. But I'm going to try not to let that 
pull too much of my attention because it's not my turn to have the critique, my work critiqued every week. This week it was my turn though. So I pulled it up and I edited the first two chapters. So I, I think it's fun. <laughs> I really enjoyed it rereading it after having not read it for six months. It was, you know, exciting to remember the plot line and, oh, that's right. This is happening. This is exciting. I love this story as much as I did when I was writing it. So that's good. It's a good feeling to have. Um, other than that, yeah, most of it is just trying to juggle those things and make sure that I'm spending the appropriate amount of time in each area. But in any case, that's as, that's all the updates as far as I know for my authoring. going to keep plugging along, trying to reach my readers. Um, so I believe given all of the that, that since that's all the updates, we might as well shift over to the interview portion of the podcast. <music> Hey, Stephanie, how are you today? I'm great. How are you, Dan? Doing very, very well. Uh, I am thrilled to chat with you because you have a lot going on in your life and in your career. And as a part of that, of course, you've published books, but you also have a podcast. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, and you do, um, let's see, coaching. Is that is that what I saw? Yeah, I got, I'm a transformational coach and a psychotherapist. That's that is amazing. So before we get into all of the facets of that and your business and whatnot, I always love to start with how long have you been writing and publishing books? Well, so I've been writing books, I'd have to say for probably a couple decades, you know, but I didn't yeah. publish them, right? Yeah. Um, for, for like a decade, I wrote this book called Nothing Strikes Deeper. And I just thought it was just this amazing, you know, book of triumph of the human spirit. And I just never published it. So it's like, I didn't believe somehow that I was really a writer. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's only been in the last five years, um, three years ago, um, I had igniting the spark, uh, or excuse me, the spark igniting your best life published and then uh, self-published that. And then a year ago, my latest book, Becoming Fierce, came out from Empower Press and Grace Point Publications. So, I mean, that it, it's taken me on just such a fun journey and being able to really go, oh, that was just something in my own mind saying I wasn't an author or I wasn't a writer. And just seeing that manifest itself and people responding to those books, it's just been an amazing journey. And I think, <laughs> I think like you said, um, for, at least for me, getting into writing is a little bit addicting, right? Because there's just this, it's a little bit cathartic to get it out in written format, whether that's handwritten or digitally. And you're like, oh, this is a message that I, mean, I think some people can benefit from. But then you start getting that feedback and it's just like, oh, this is awesome, right? I want more. Like, I want to share more of what I know. And you probably are a wealth of knowledge given your experience with the coaching and the speaking and <clears throat> all the stuff that you have going on. So why not share it? You know, and, and honestly, it's one of those things where I just felt super moved. Um, you know, I wrote the first book and, um, and both books, I do have to tell you, like, as I was writing them, I didn't really feel like it was me necessarily. I mean, I literally felt like I was just going to the computer and getting like these divine downloads and it would just flow through me. And what was really ironic and awesome was I was being interviewed on Karen Curry Parker's podcast and about the first book, The Spark. Mm -hmm. And towards the end of the interview, she's like, so what's next for you? And I said, well, I think I have another book coming because I'm like stopping at stoplights and writing little notes. And, you know, I have these little ideas coming through and we get done with the interview. And she says to me, you know, I want to let you know that my business partner and I own a publishing company and we'd like to publish your second book. That is awesome. So totally serendipitously that happened. That's so, so cool. Yeah. yeah. I love that. It's amazing. So I think there's a lot of people out there that there's just this fear of writing. There's this fear of sharing whatever message they have. Uh, but I, I've heard so many stories of people who, like you, are just like, I, know, I just put these things down, didn't think much of it. Um, but because they have well-intentioned hearts, you know, they have good intentions with sharing this story, whether it be fiction or nonfiction. It just seems like chips kind of fall into place for a lot of them. They're like, oh, I guess this is just supposed to happen. Right. And and that's a great situation. I mean, how amazing. It's not like a sign to you that this this book needs to go out for people. 
Totally. So. You know, and, and I feel like what, what was beautiful about both those processes is because of my podcast, um, I have met some of the most, you know, brilliant minds and serving hearts on the planet. And I really, in both books, you know, I've really distilled down some of their essential wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so it's like this beautiful combination of like 36 years of my own professional growth, you know, um, working on personal growth and mental health with people as a therapist. And then combining that with all these different peoples and, and I'm a big researcher, you know, so I had researched all like best practices and different ways, whether it was how to reduce anxiety or how to truly cultivate a loving relationship with yourself or how to get rid of, you know, limiting beliefs or whatever that was that was blocking or limiting people. And I mean, that's one of my biggest joys in my personal life is bringing that collective wisdom together and then being able to you know, witness to other people's healing. I mean, that's just one of the most awesome gifts ever for me. So to, to be able to bring that in book form and share that with a wider, wider audience was, it's been amazingly meaningful. And, and I love that. I think it's encouraging, hopefully, to people who have ideas, who, you know, I think sometimes we have a, a tendency to get in our heads about our experience and be like, oh, I don't really feel like I know much about X topic or whatever it is. But then in the process of creating that story, if I know, actually, I know way more than I thought, right? <laughs> like, I'm yes. more experienced than I thought based on my anecdotes or experiences. You know, a lot of people really love writing memoirs, which, you know, that's kind of a different realm of writing. But there's so much in your life that you can draw from experience wise. It can benefit so many people. And I just, I, I love the examples that you've given and, and how you've taken that. So I want to talk a little bit about your book, um, books, you know, probably a combination of both. So the, the spark igniting your best life. Tell me where the inspiration came for this specific topic, right? And, you know, what are some of the key messages that people can draw from a book? Like obviously without giving away too much, we obviously yeah, want yeah, people yeah. to buy your book, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think that for me, one of the things that, the, you know, I, I was always asked this question, like, so what is the spark? Because my podcast for almost five years was the spark. Now it's called igniting the spark. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's my book. It's, it's my brand. We do. We had the spark summit. My film is when sparks ignite. Um, that's still playing on Plex network on the more you channel, you know, so everything was spark and people say to me, well, what is the spark? And so for me, what that is, it's that's our essence. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that part of us that is just truly, truly who we are, our authentic self and the light that we are in the world. And oftentimes, you know, we have circumstances or situations where that can feel like it's covered up. Mm -hmm. And so our work is like, how do we excavate that spark that is truly innate within us? So I think that that book, The Spark, Igniting Your Best Life, is not only information, um, you know, I had permission from several clients to share their stories of how they also were able to, you know, cultivate that spark really igniting within them. But also at the end of every chapter, there's, you know, exercises so that people can integrate and assimilate what they've just read into their own lives. Mm. So it's, it's, I, I just thought that was so important, like top five takeaways. That's what it is in that book. There's top five takeaways at the end of every chapter. So whether it's a written exercise or it's something that you can just practice being mindful about, how do you integrate this so that you're not just reading it, but you're incorporating it and then living it. So it becomes a part of who you are so that you can really see, oh my gosh, this stuff really does work. And I don't have to go from just surviving my life. I can really step into thriving. And I think that's what the spark's all about. Uh, first of all, I, I appreciate you putting those uh, summaries at the end because I've read both types of nonfiction books with and without those. And every single time I get to the summer, I'm like, oh, this is perfect, right? Like, um, because there's just so much going on. And oftentimes I'll, I listen to a lot of audiobooks while I'm working with the goats and the chickens and stuff, which I love audiobooks. The challenge is you have these ideas and everything. And then it's like, oh, where did they go? Right. Like I, it's hard to sum it all up. And so the sum chapters help a ton. Second of all, I want to talk a little bit about the spark because I agree with you. I think that as humans, particularly in certain 
areas of the world. And we won't, I mean, get political or talk. It's just, it's sometimes, you know, there's these cultures of um, not taking enough time for yourself because busyness, right? And just go, 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 go. And I think there's a lot of people that kind of forget the spark, kind of the light, the joy of experiencing anything, you know, whether it be good things, bad things, there's just a, a certain amount of learning and joy you can get from it. And um, that spark, as you're what you're referring to, gets lost or, or sucked into those things. So for you, what if someone's finding themselves in this space where maybe they don't have their spark or maybe they've forgotten it? Um, what do you recommend to people who who are in this space who might need to find that again? Yeah, that's such a great question, because I think that that's really common. We really saw that during the pandemic where mm -hmm. people really were shut in or they felt isolated and life seemed like it kind of dulled down. Mm -hmm. So refinding that or reigniting that spark, I feel like that's been a lot of my work with clients. And so one of the things, honestly, that I have people do, and it's one of the exercises in that first book. Uh, but it's about finding the things, the smallest of things that bring you pleasure mm. because, you know, we, so we have these minds that are, our brains have a natural negativity bias. Mm -hmm. And what that is, it's, it's that it's, a, it's our fight or flight, you know, it's that mm -hmm. hippocampus amygdala combo that has beautifully perpetuated our species, but that caveman brain, unfortunately, what it does though, is it's always scanning the environment for a threat. So we naturally notice the negative. And that's why if you touched a hot pan when you were a kid, you don't have to keep touching it. Like your mm -hmm. brain goes, okay, Velcro experience. I'm going to file that away. I never have to do that again. And I always say positive experiences are like two fried eggs on a Teflon pan. They just slide right out. You know, we don't need them <laughs> to survive, yeah. right? Yeah. So our brain doesn't always hold on to them. So what we have to do is be really intentional about noticing the positive, even if they're the littlest of moments in our lives. So what I do is I have people come up with a list of pleasures and I call it pleasures because it really is when you pause and marinate just for a moment on them. For me, the, the smallest of examples could be down when I woke up this morning I have this big picture window beside me here. And every morning when I just open those curtains, even if it's a cloudy day, it floods the house with light. Mm -hmm. And I take a pause and I always notice that. It's like I bring it into my awareness. I take that moment when my dogs rush in in the morning. I have two awesome dogs, one standard poodle and one golden doodle. Mm -hmm. They're the most loving, joyful creatures. And so instead of just, oh, the dogs, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about pausing. It's about noticing. You know, and research says it takes... 18 to 30 seconds of actually marinating on something that feels good to get it to stick hmm. so that your brain's going like, oh, this is important. I'm going to pay attention to this. Okay. So what we also know from quantum physics is what we focus on expands. So if you're focusing on these things during the day and you make this list, I invite people to really start with all of your senses. Like, what do I love to hear? You know, do I, when I go out in my backyard in the morning, I notice the birds, you know, I notice maybe the wind and the aspen leaves, um, whatever those sounds are that really bring you pleasure. It could be, you know, kids laughing. It could be, you know, whatever that is that brings you that, that pleasure, that subtle joy. And then things you see, it could be right now, there's gorgeous green trees out from my window right now, you know, beautiful blue sky. These are things that are available to all of us. You know, it might be a painting in your house or a picture that brings back a special memory of something that really makes you feel good. So it's like you have all these little anchor points, something that you love to smell, that you love to taste, that you love to touch. And so all of these things can be that doorway into igniting that spark within you. It's almost like it starts, you know, breaking out this, breaking up this little crust maybe that's, that's formed over that spark. And that's how the light starts getting in. And we can do that just by starting to, okay, every morning I want to, that's going to be my new intention. We're talking about something, Dan, that takes two to three minutes. It doesn't have to be a lot, but those are the things we can start doing. And, and then I feel like I'm on a, a rant here, but I think this is <laughs> important a good rant. because, 
<laughs> Thank you. Because I, I feel like I, I talk about in that book, you know, the bookends of our day. And so to begin your morning that way, really in a mindfulness place, and you can bring to heart too. I always love gratitude practices. I mean, they're mm -hmm. real. The research behind them is real. So you, you can look at these things that bring you pleasure and then bring gratitude into your heart. You know, actually put your hand on your heart, again, marinating on those good feelings. At the end of the day, what I really invite people to do is right before you go to bed. And this is important because whatever we're doing right before bed, whatever we're thinking about, we're going to be marinating on for seven, eight, nine hours. So in our subconscious mind. So we want it to be something we want to be marinating on, right? So I have people think of what is the best part of your day? What was the best part that happened? And you can do this as a reminder. I love to tell people, get a stationary object, get your favorite rock. It might be something that is really meaningful to you. Um, some people have like, you know, a little angel statue, whatever that would be, but you hold on to it every night. So you have some muscle memory and then you think, what was the best thing that happened today? You bring it up in your mind. Now, here's the cool thing. As you're marinating on it, not only do you get the benefits of feeling good again, but you're telling your brain, this is important, pay attention, and you'll start noticing more of those things the next day. That's, so mean, that's what I would do. That's incredible to think about something like that, because I mean, I've, you know, think, considering everything that you said, I think the tendency, particularly for, you know, people in a situation, I'm going to use myself as an example, where, you know, they want to be an author, they have this strong desire to be a full time author, and they have this, this feeling that life, these moments are getting in the way. So it's amazing, you know, you say, just take 18 to 30 seconds, let something marinate, you know, take two to three minutes to really reflect on it. It's incredible when a person gets into this busy mindset, how long two minutes feels. Right. And I think that's an indicator that you're not <laughs> you're in the wrong place. Right. Something's wrong. If you look at two minutes and say that is so much time, I don't have time for two minutes. So like, OK, well, that's the problem. Right. Something something needs to change because two minutes really isn't that long in the scheme of a 24 hour day. You know, you're sleeping for oh, roughly a third of that. Um, you know, two minutes isn't isn't that long. So um, I love that you said talk. I want to kind of double click on the, the muscle memory thing, the taking the intentional moments every night before you go to sleep. I generally read before I go to sleep. I should probably do some reflecting on my day. I'll take that piece of advice. I don't read bad things. I just generally read kind of fantasy, sci-fi type stuff. Um, I have wild dreams. Let's go ahead and say that. But um, <laughs> they're good usually. Of course. Uh, but I love that, you know, the small little uh, bits of, habits that you need to create in terms of reflecting on day to day, you know, every minutes as you can of, of good feelings, positive feelings, but the, the feeling, you know, grabbing something and holding on to it. I think a lot of people don't realize the way the human brain thrives on habits and structure. Even if you're like myself, I don't love structure. I don't plan a lot of things in my life because you know, I like to fly by the seat of my pants, so to speak, is kind of how I thrive. But there's something to be saying. I have with respect to my writing, I've done a similar thing. I try to always reflect on the positive aspects of writing so that it never turns into this negative thing. There's a lot of authors who, you know, get in their head about the, you know, I'm a bad author or my writing's terrible or whatever. And so every time they get to their writing session, it takes them 30 minutes to an hour to even get in the mindset to start writing. Whereas I can pick up and within 30 seconds, I can start writing. And it's because I've only reflected on the positive feelings I get while I'm writing, that kind of investigative, excited feeling and anything else negative. And like, I don't have time for that, right? Like I'm going to focus only on these things. And so I have a positive feeling towards it and it just flows so much better. And I think if I apply the same type of thing as reflecting at night, your life trends in that direction where it's like, oh, this is what you're focusing on. Um, I'm going to start focusing a little bit more on these. It's easier to do it as you go through time. So I think that's something that hopefully people can learn from. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think that the thing that you're talking about, that's so true. You know, we were talking about this a little bit before the interview, just that whole writer's block or authors being like, oh, I don't have time or I can't do this. Can't fit everything in. And one of the one of the best pieces of advice I had gotten from a New York Times bestselling author 
um, he had told me, you know, just have your outline, just write it down. It can be a working outline. It doesn't matter. You just write this, you know, chapter one, chapter two, just the titles. And then you show up at the computer. And for me, what I would do, and it, and I, I have to say, I feel a little bit lucky with the second book with Becoming Fierce, because after that, that interview I had told you about, I met with Karen Curry's business partner, Michelle Vandepass, the next day. And as we were talking and I'm sharing some of my life story with her, she said, oh, my God, Stephanie, she said, you are fierce. You are fierce. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's the name of the book, Becoming Fierce. And that night I woke up at 115 in the morning. I'll never forget. And I wrote the whole outline. I mean, just like, boom, boom, boom. It just came through. But what was so awesome about that, and I did end up rearranging a couple of the chapters and that was cool. That was fine. But in the morning, what I would do is I just wrote whatever came out. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I would show up at the keyboard and it did feel like just this cool download would just happen. And, and again, this, this gentleman's advice was just whatever it is. It doesn't matter if you don't use it. It doesn't matter. Whatever is coming through, type, 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 type. And my husband was blown away, you know, because he saw me in that process. And he was like, oh my gosh. I mean, you were just so dedicated to showing up. And the thing was, that was an easy habit to cultivate. We don't have to cultivate these huge, huge habits, like you said. I mean, they can be two minutes. They can be however many minutes. I would show up and whatever was in me, that's what I allowed to come out that day. I didn't have to say, I am writing for two hours every day, or I'm, you know, maybe one day it'd be 20 minutes. Maybe one day it would be two hours and I just couldn't stop. But to allow that flow and to give yourself that time. And I think it does matter, Dan, too. Like if you're a morning person, plug in then. Mm -hmm. If you're an evening person, plug in then. Whatever your best time to allow that flow to happen. And so to to get out of your own way, right? Mm -hmm. To get out of your own way and get out of your head to allow that creative flow to come through. And you don't have to use it all. You don't have, it doesn't have to be, oh my gosh, this is the printed version right now. It's like, no, this is, I'm on a thought. I've got this. And, and that's why the outline helped. Cause I could go, oh, um, actually one of the chapters in Becoming Fierce is about serendipity. So, you know, and about how that can really work in our lives. And when we start noticing those things. So I just would plug in and type, 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 type. And then you can go through it later. You can sort through what feels like, oh, this is the stuff that sticks. This is the juice. I want to keep this. Absolutely. And and that is is the one thing that (laughs) I always feel bad when people come and ask me, what do you do when you hit writer's block? And I tell them, I I'm, I hate to say this, but I've never, ever been in a place where I've had writer's block. And, you know, it really comes down to exactly what you described. That is why I haven't ever experienced writer's block, because I have conditioned my brain to accept that I can let anything flow out, whatever it is. Now, I, I, I'm always an advocate for plotting. But for those of you listening, I don't outline anything. <laughs> It's just not, oh, I love it's it. It's not the way my brain works. I'm an intu- we call ourselves an intuitive writer, right? Uh-huh, I think uh-huh. intu- intuition comes in all phases of the writing. And so, but I think what you what you said is kind of the crux of being a successful, productive writer with whatever your circumstances are, no matter how busy you are. It's the moment where you sit down and you're like, I am committed to allowing myself this time to write. And, you know, people, if they, if it takes you 30 minutes to get into the writing session, that's a problem, right? I can usually log, click in within 30 seconds to two minutes. Just like, all right, I'm here. I'm just going to let it flow out. And sometimes it's a little bit rough, but I'm finding the more and more I do that, the less rough it is each time um, because your brain just knows it's writing time. Let's get this out. And I don't overthink it. I think that's the first piece. I don't overthink it, right? Totally. You're getting in your way. Like you said, you're, you're stopping yourself. You let it flow and it's incredible. You, you get to the end of it. And it's just like uh, you kind of lose yourself in the writing. And then when your alarm goes off or whatever your time, maybe it's 20 minutes, like you said, or two hours or whatever you have, you're like, wow, that was, you have to like come back to life a little bit. <laughs> so it's just like, that was just flowing so well. <laughs> I kind of lost awareness of my surroundings for a moment, which is, it's just a great feeling. I, it is like, right. That, I mean, that's flow. 
That yep. is that beautiful state of flow. And, and it's, it's a peak state for us. Mm-hmm. So how awesome as an author to allow yourself to plug in. And I love what you're saying. And if you remember that old classic book, The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron, yeah, you know, she talked about morning pages. And so morning pages were the practice of literally just waking up and writing whatever comes to your mind. You could mm-hmm. be like, I am brain dead right now. I am, mm-hmm. you know, I am a sleepy Sue, whatever that is. It doesn't matter, but you're writing, writing, writing. And then all of a sudden you click into flow. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like that's the process that you use as well. Generally, awesome. yeah. And I try to adopt that for, everything else as well, because I think, you know, I was, I was actually talking to someone else recently and I, I think most of us have heard at this point that the idea of multitasking is a myth, right? Um, it just your brain can't split processing. It's going to focus a little bit on one thing and then switch and then switch to train. It doesn't do things concurrently generally. And so I think once you learn to kind of allow your mind to separate into these different areas, the time to switch to each thing doesn't take as much time. It's like, I'm finished writing. Great. I need to get back into work. Or maybe it's time to hang out with the kids. I can let everything else go and just focus on that thing. And that's the that's the hardest thing for a lot of people to learn, I think. Um, but I think that is where, like you said, the cry, like how you described it as a crust around the spark. Right. I think probably lots of us have crusty sparks at this point. <laughs> uh, you know, we go in and out of it. But yeah. that's when it starts to peek through because some of the, I like to call it baggage, the life negativity baggage starts to fall off of that. And then those glimmering moments can peek through. And you remember each time, you may forget each night, you know, when you get to the stress or the busyness. But if you reflect on it, you're like, oh, no, there's lots of little glimmers of light. They were there. They were just masked by this negativity, by this busyness, so to speak. So. Yeah, just different perspectives, right? Um, I think so. I think there's a lot to be said about what you've described in your book. I do want to talk a little bit about um, for you, it, you know, how do you approach the you know, preparation phase, looking forward to ensure that you remember to take the time to do these things? Is there anything that you need to do for yourself to remember to take these time, these moments to reflect on the positivity? Yeah, well, I think you you hit on it when you said, you know, we, we have to form the habit, mm-hmm. right? We're habitual creatures. We have a habitual brain. And so I do think having a morning and evening routine, that is the ticket. Um, and, you know, a lot of us, I can't think of the author's name right now, but, you know, the book Atomic Habits that was so big mm-hmm. everywhere. Mm-hmm. Really what that book's talking about is the atom, the smallest little unit of change that we can make. You know, change doesn't happen when we're like, okay, I'm going to do a 180. I'm going to do everything different in my life. Like that's not going to stick. That's mm-hmm. not going to work. But if we do these little um, changes, these little incremental things, that's what makes the change. So I do think, is there preparation? No, I think we just say, okay, today I'm going to commit to doing this, you know, three to five minutes in the morning, three to five minutes at night. Like you said, I mean, it's literally 10 minutes out of your entire day. Everybody has time for that. I don't care how busy you are. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's about making yourself a priority in your own life. And that's a big thing, you know, in my Becoming Fierce book that I talked about is how do you truly befriend yourself? Mm-hmm. You know, and part of the way we do that, because, you know, we've all heard the old cliche, like, oh, just love yourself, be your own best friend. <laughs> but I am telling you, you know, 36 years in the mental health and personal development field, I know it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. We don't just flip a switch and think I'm incredible. You know, it's, it's literally, (laughs) it's, it's daily intentional work and we let ourselves down and we haven't shown up for ourselves. So part of the way we start cultivating a true friendship with ourselves is like, Hey, I'm going to, for this week, you can just start with a week for this week. Most of us can commit to seven days to doing something. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start this practice. And then the cool thing is, you know, the research used to be 30 days and now they're saying 21 days of doing something every day, our brain locks it in as a habit. And then we don't have to push ourselves to do it. Mm -hmm. So it just becomes that automatic, like we wake up and look forward to it. We wake up and go, oh, I'm going to do my, you know, my morning pages. I'm going to wake up and do this intentional mindset. And So I think, you know, and I, I'll tell you, Dan, I tell people those morning practices, it's really priming your entire day 
you know, like heart, mind, body, soul, so that you're going into your day in the best way possible. And you actually have some resources. And so as you start showing up for yourself in those ways, you start going like, oh, I do have my own back, Mm -hmm. you know, and and I imagine for you too, you know, as a father of all these kiddos, you know, and, and running this farm that you have, it's like, oh my gosh, when you take care of you, and you, and this is not about being selfish, but it's allowing yourself to be priority in your own life in that way where I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to cultivate this relationship with me. And wow, do I show up so much more intact, in tune and attuned to those around me. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to just interject this because I think, you know, that there's, there's a few things with respect to creating habits, as well as getting yourself in a more positive and, you know, reigniting your spark, so to speak. The first thing is patience. I think um, as humans, we we go in and out of having patience, um, but it, it does require patience. It, it requires mm-hmm. diligence and dedication and consistency in connection with that patience. The other thing I will say is sacrifice. And I think a lot of people maybe don't, they, they downplay this one a little bit. But there's a lot of things competing for our attention, right? And they may be getting in the way of us wanting to create habits. Primarily, I'm just going to list some examples, right? Generally, media, social media, you know, distractions with the news. You know, we tend to get stuck in some of these things. And sometimes you do need to sacrifice things that aren't enhancing the life that you want to have. You, you have to recognize little, I really want to keep doing X thing, whatever it is. But I'm going to have to sacrifice that a little bit. You know, let's say you're spending an hour on social media a day. You know, maybe some sacrifice needs to happen to slot in some of the other more important things. Um, that's a whole other topic, though. You know, we don't have to, to get into that. But I think that kind of goes into the habits. There's also, um, I don't know if this is not a technical term. I'm not a psychologist. But it almost feels like negative habits, right? The habit oh, yeah. of not doing something. Right. Um, Because you've got those negative habits where you're like, you get stuck, you ingrained, you feel some people, you know, this is in no way a knock on someone, but they dislike that they wake up and they get on social media right away. I was there. I've totally Mm -hmm. been there before. Mm -hmm. But you have to um, reverse that habit, right? By, you know, removing it with a, replacing it with a different habit. And that's where that sacrifice comes in. You have to start it and you have to be, you know, accept that sacrifice as steps toward a better life so anyway i totally agree no i know i mean we could go on and on because you know as you're talking about this i i think about one of the important things and one of the things i actually love about the new book becoming fierce is it really reflects a lot of my own life Mm -hmm. because i always feel like none of us get out of this life unscathed and i definitely didn't either and i and i had a really rough uh adolescence, I would say, when my parents divorced and my world Mm. blew apart and, you know, spent literally 15 years trying to learn how to cultivate self-love. And and so this, you know, this thing of these routines that we're talking about, or this taking time to really tune in, you know, that, that didn't just, I didn't just read that in a book and go, oh, that sounds great. Let's do that. Um, You know, it was something that I lived. And so I think you know, as you're talking about all this, the other piece, you know, that comes up for me along with sacrifice is the word surrender, Mm, mm -hmm. you know, and and I feel like that's been one of the big pieces in my life because when I've tried to make things happen and I wanted this to go my way, it didn't. And for me, you know, and people have different ideas of like their higher power, whatever that is. But for me, what I call the divine, my higher power, when I surrender to that and say, okay, there's something that has way more intelligence than me. There's something that literally has an idea of how this is going to flow. All of a sudden my life opens up and that's where those serendipitous and amazing miracles happen. You know, and I had that with my film. I've had that over and over again in my life, which has been huge life-changing things and I won't go into it, but some of that's, you know, in becoming fierce and that life really isn't about grind and push. And it's also where we open up and say, you know, I want to be a conduit for all these good things to come through me and into the world. How can I be that conduit? So part of the way we can do that is by doing our own work. 
mm-hmm. you know, and, and if you look on my film poster on When Sparks Ignite, the words underneath the title are your period healing period matters. Mm. Period. And that's really because as each of us excavates our own spark and allows that to shine, that's how we can help others to ignite theirs. Absolutely. You do have to take care of yourself before you can give back. That's the sometimes it's hard to remember that when you've got a lot going on. You just want to do everything for everybody, but you know, you're sacrificing unintentionally your own self care, which is not that's a bad kind of exactly. sacrifice. That's not exactly. actually helping anybody in, in any way. But uh, I, this has been an amazing conversation. We could probably talk forever. There's so many facets to this topic. There's so many things that we could dive down rabbit holes to, to dig into, but we are running short on time. So before we end here, I always love to ask, where can people find more information about you and your coaching and your podcast and your books and all these great things going on? Yeah. So, so people can go on to my website, which is stephaniejames.world. So stephaniejames.world and there's a trailer to the film. There's a link for both of my books. Um, I've got some free gifts there that, you know, people can sign on to and become a part of a newsletter if they want to, or they can literally email me directly at stephaniethespark at gmail.com. And I always personally respond. Um, I love building relationship with my audience. And yeah, that's, you know, my mission in the world. I truly, in my heart, it's like, I just want to bring as much love and healing to the world as possible. And Mm -hmm. so that's what I'm trying to do, Dan, through all these different mediums. That is, that is a good work. I think there should be, there should be more of that. I wish there was. There's just, unfortunately, a lot of negativity coming from various sources so this is amazing i appreciate all that you do this is great thank you i appreciate what you do i said that's you know that's why we're here right we're sharing we share yeah. knowledge and experiences but thank yeah. you so much this has been amazing thank you dan i hope you found that helpful and encouraging because there's a lot of us who you know whether or not we believe it or know it <laughs> have lost the spark of life or that motivation, that excitement to live and to just experience everything that we have in our lives. And if you've reached that point, it's time to pause, reflect, and reignite that spark. Find that joy you have in the things you're doing. And unfortunately, I think for a lot of us, authoring sometimes slips down on the priority list. Whether or not it has to, I think, depends on the person. But it doesn't have to be what you sacrifice. There are other things that don't necessarily provide as much value to our lives that maybe we should stop doing. Uh, And in my case, social media was falling into that realm. So we shouldn't feel guilty letting go of those things that might not actually help us find that spark, find that motivation and excitement to live. So keep that in mind. And yeah, hopefully you learn some things from Stephanie. She has a lot of experience in this area. So once again, since it's on a two-week schedule now, the next episode won't be out for another two weeks. That will be on the 17th of August. So if, you're, if you'd if you like to join me on the podcast, head to dankenner.com slash podcast and fill out the form there. I have a plenty of people, prospects that I will be interviewing, but if you'd like to join me, share your experience, whether you're a new author, you're an experienced author, independently published, traditionally published, or even if you're just like you know, related to publishing, you're an artist or maybe an editor or something. If you have a story to share, let me know. Um, Thank you again for tuning in today. And uh, if you, if you enjoyed it, share with your friends and subscribe for more episodes. Thanks so much. Mm